There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Is all debt bad? Find out in this episode of Shauna Shares Community Q&A. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. Welcome back to the show. So, so good to have you here. I have to tell you, these new Shauna Shares episodes are some of my favorites because I get to really answer your questions directly, and you have some amazing questions There are so many questions that have been sent in that it's going to take me probably years to get through all the questions, but I like it. I love it, actually. I was always the kid that never wanted to ask a question in school, so I just let everyone else ask questions, and I quickly learned that it's okay to ask questions, and when it comes to money, the more questions you ask, the better off you're going to be, because this is complicated. It's it's actually very simple, the the way that you effectively manage money. But what we've done is we just complicated it so much and then we don't teach about money. So that complicates it even more than we add stress and anxiety and fear. And before you know it, it just feels like a tornado and you can't separate what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. So it's just a, it's just a giant cloud of confusion. But what I want you to know is it's okay to ask questions, as many as you have, because chances are someone else listening has the exact same question. So just because there are so many questions that have been sent in already, please don't let that stop you from asking a question. You can head right to the show notes. There's a Shauna Shares link. Click that. Fill out your question. You can even remain anonymous. But 
the more questions that we can tackle, I think the more we can really feel like a community here. Today's community question comes from Sheila, and Sheila says, Hi there, Shauna. Thanks for all the great money gems that you dish out on the show. You've really changed my life, and I love listening to episodes over and over again because I always learn something different. This podcast is like my fun encyclopedia for all things money. Now that sounds bad, but seriously, this show is fun and educational. Okay, so I have a question. I've really been thinking about my debt and wanting to seriously tackle it. I know you've done a lot of episodes on debt, but curious if there's just one that you could point me to. I'm trying to reframe how I'm thinking about debt as well. I know you mentioned not all debt is bad. I mean, is that true? I seriously hope so because it really feels unrealistic to say that I will never have debt and that when I'm debt free, I won't ever have debt again. That just doesn't make any sense. So I think the trick is to figure out how to pay off my debt with a strategy like you say and then have a good mindset about debt going forward. Anyway, I'd love to hear any guest over again that you think has a good perspective on this whole debt thing. Please keep up the podcast. It's honestly the reason why my finances are so together and it feels really good. Sheila, I hear you. (laughs) I hear you really loud and clear. It is unrealistic to think that you're never going to be in debt again for the rest of your life. In fact, a lot of really smart and wealthy people I know use debt as a tool to leverage more money to grow their wealth. There is a strategy to it. And you're right. There is, um, let's just say, a particular famous male money expert that says that you have to be debt free always. And that just does not fly in my book. It doesn't even make sense. People are killing themselves to be debt free. And then what? Life goes on. Things happen. So I'm not saying that paying off your debt is a bad thing. That is an amazing accomplishment. Are you kidding me? That takes a lot of grit, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. But what I'm saying is it's unrealistic, in my opinion, to think that you are going to go through the rest of your life and never have debt or never utilize debt as a tool to leverage more money. All right. So we have to, yeah, we have to pay off our expensive debt, but then we have to change how we're thinking about debt. So Yeah, there have been so many good episodes of people who have talked about debt. I think one that I love and that I think is worth another listen is with Michael Bovey. So Michael is a debt expert and co-founder of Resolve, which is a company that helps people in financial distress navigate their way to financial health. We talked about so much, but in particular, the practical ways to get out of debt beyond snowball and avalanche methods, which are very effective, but how do we go beyond that? And then Michael answers the ever elusive question, which is your question, Sheila, is all debt bad? So let's jump into the chat and revisit Michael's stellar advice on debt. I read that you like to, as you say, get your geek on talking about debt and credit issues. So I thought, well, let's just start out geeking out a little bit. Obviously, America has this massive debt problem. Uh, last year, consumer debt approached somewhere around $14 trillion. You might have a more exacting number. I'm curious, what are the main factors that is causing this debt to continue to rise? Well, there's you can break the debt up quite a bit. Just uh, student loan, that, that's a massive amount of debt. Um, just more than a decade ago, just over a decade ago, it didn't represent the pile more than uh, credit card debt. Credit card used, used to be over a trillion. Now it's just maybe under or approaching a trillion again. But student loan debt is probably one of the biggest problems and the biggest factors into the life choices that we make. Now, I'm a little bit older than that now, but there's a plenty of people, including my daughters, that are out there making life choices based on, you know, and their, their peers making uh, very impactful life choices based on debt. And so I would say that that's probably the, the biggest um, anchor around a lot of young adults and even not so young adults uh, because they st- <laughs> they're still paying them off too. So that and, and credit cards, obviously, and medical, those are the things that I tend to see people struggle with the most. Right. And do you see student loan debt? Is that just continuing to rise year after year? I don't see it going down. It's not, uh, the government basically subsidizes the kinds of tuition and the costs and living cost of living on campus. Um, when you're giving guaranteed loans out, the colleges are going to rise to the challenge and make it more expensive is what I've seen. 
Yes, unfortunately. It'll be interesting to see if there's anything that comes along that is kind of like an alternative way to go to college or get some sort of skill where people aren't fifty, sixty thousand dollars plus in debt. Those calls are very hard for me. I, I love what I do. I talk to on average about sixteen people a day. Just basic first conversation. What's going on with you? Uh, you know, usually it's it's a debt triage situation. They they're running out of money before they run out of month, and that's why I'm on the phone with them. And it's heartbreaking to realize that because you can't bankrupt your your student loan debt. It's it's most of the time you have to have severe hardships. And so this is an albatross around someone's neck. And again. Um, you know, family formation is diminishing, uh, the ability to buy homes and do other kinds of consumer spending because of these things. And sometimes the, the degree just isn't worth it. It doesn't pay for itself. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. And I'm curious, there are all these different, I don't know if the right word is movements, but I'm going to use that word movements. And a lot of financial experts are saying that, of course, having debt is a, is a bad thing. The goal, of course, is to always be debt free. But there is this message around debt that somehow if you have debt, if you're in debt, you've failed somehow. You've not hit the ultimate financial success, if you will. I'm curious, because you deal with this all day long, what sort of outlook should we have on debt? And is all debt bad? So yes and no, right? So there's there's the idea of somebody living in a location, if they're going to be there more than, say, eight, 10 years, it makes a ton of sense for them to actually buy a home rather than pay for somebody else's investment, right? Sure. And, and there's people that just the, the kind of a more mobile economy that we have today that your job might take you places every two to three years, or you want to keep your options open. And so buying a home, that would be bad debt in that in that situation, unless you're in an environment where home prices are raising. We saw the housing led implosion and recession, uh, people a little gun shy, but they're back in the water. It's just, it's really about your lifestyle how how long you're going to be in a place. And some people will make an argument that um, housing debt is good debt. And then there's everything else. And uh, so are you a student loan? And we, we started off talking about that. Is that a good debt? Well, look, if you're going to invest in your future and you're going to become a higher earner as a result of that experience and that degree, uh, going back to graduate school, for example, and, and you have a clear path and visibility on how those dollars are going to increase for you over time, obviously a good investment in yourself too. Credit card debt, however, not so good, right? If you're carrying a balance month over month, everything you just bought is more expensive than the price tag. We all like to bargain shop, right? We're out there, we're looking for deals, especially <laughs> coming out of, like, at the time we're talking, we're coming out of Black Friday, today's uh, Cyber Monday, right? Everybody's looking for a, a great price on gifts. And you go out there, you, you splurge, you do it on plastic. And if you don't pay that balance off on your next billing cycle, you're giving money away. And now those items that you that you spent such a, yeah, a lot of us will spend quite a bit of time trying to find the right price on the items that we're going to get for others and maybe even a couple of things for ourselves. But if you're going to pay interest on it, that price tag just got a lot higher. And so I would say in almost all situations, carrying balances on your credit cards, if you have it to avoid, always avoid. That's such a good point. And I think we don't think about that often, that if we have debt on our credit card, whatever we're buying, we're essentially buying it at a 25 or 20 percent or whatever the interest rate is markup. And if we actually saw the item at that price, we'd probably freak out and say, I'm not buying it. <laughs> you pass. Exactly. Us, for sure. Exactly. And I'm also curious if you could expound a little bit on the correlation between credit score and and debt or particularly interest rates that are associated with debt. So, um, so I'm, I'm a little bit older. And so I'm coming up on 50. I'm 49 years old this year. And don't I can tell anybody. Tell, don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's a secret. Okay. So at a time, just 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, when actually when reward credit card kind of shopping, um, shifting cards for the different rewards that you can get became more and more of the rage in say 2002, three, four. And interest rates were pretty low. I mean, there were banks competing with each other, giving right. interest rates at eight, nine, seven, eleven percent. And that right now, the average interest rate, I believe, is like twenty four point seven percent or something along those lines. Super duper high. Wow. Yeah. And it almost doesn't matter about your credit score. In a lot of cases, you apply for a new card and you've got a seven ninety credit score. Your actual rate is seventeen, twenty one percent, something like that. So it's um, banks are. This is a, a historically high interest 
environment for credit cards and banks are making it up on all those rewards. That's, you know, they're giving away stuff to get people over to use their cards and pay for items so that they get those, those exchange fees. But, um, they're making it up on interest of, for the people that carry a balance, that is, which for I think about 35, 40% of us adults in the U.S. carry a balance month over month. So the only way to really win with those types of cards is to just treat it like a debit card, pay it off in full every month, take the rewards, and don't even have to worry about the interest portion. Yep. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that. And I know there are a lot of different ways to get out of debt. And I think anyone listening to this episode is going to be particularly tuned into what are some of the ways that that someone who, if they're looking at debt, whether it's student loan or credit card debt, and they're trying to figure out how in the world do I get rid of this? Maybe they're living paycheck to paycheck. What are some of the ways that somebody can proactively go about getting rid of some of this debt? So I'm I'm a triage guy. That's what I'm known for. I'm when when you're running out of runway or again you run out of money before you run out of month and some things are going to suffer. When I'm dealing with people in these like, you know, 16-ish calls that I do on a in a regular day, I'm mostly dealing with people that went splat. They hit the debt wall so hard right. that, you know, it it hurt. And then there's occasional times where over 20 plus years of doing this that I'm dealing with people is like, wow, it's really a luxury to have all mainstream debt relief options available to you. Um, but you can still bootstrap this. You can still do Dave Ramsey-esque debt avalanche, debt snowball, you know, and you start there. You start with what is going to be the least confrontational way, if, if there is a way to deal with this debt and not have it impede or impact my credit life, my credit score, any of my near term credit goals. And so you, you look at what can you do to take a little extra and pay off either the lowest balance or the highest interest. Those are the two methods that you use. And then as you finish off an account that you've, you've paid off to zero, you take the money that you were spending on that one and apply it to the next balance and so forth. You can go, you can extrapolate that. You can take that as far as, you know, paying off your student loans that way after the credit cards, the higher interest rate debt is gone and then move yeah. on to your mortgage even. But what I'm traditionally dealing with are people that hit and just splat right that wall. And now they've got tough, tough decisions to make. And it's almost not credit score centric. It's like, okay, <laughs> that, that, that ship sailed. I don't care about my credit anymore. <laughs> it might already be damaged anyway. Right. And so usually I'm talking to people about three options. You start with the most, uh, excuse me, the least confrontational, which is nonprofit credit counseling. There's about 80 of these national companies around the country. The option has been around for decades. It's the most popular. It's heavily regulated. Essentially, you take your credit card debts and your participating loan debts that are unsecured, and you enroll them in a plan with a nonprofit credit counseling agency, who on average is going to get your monthly payment of all of the participating creditors down to 2%. That's your new monthly payment. And it's going to be that way for no more than 60 months. Feds won't allow wow. the plans to go longer than five years. And that's it. Does It's really not impeding your credit. It's just like they close the accounts, you might drop a point or two. But it's on autopilot. And if you have a steady income and you can commit to that kind of repayment, it's ideal. And it's, it's, again, if we're talking about a 24% average credit card rate drop down to what's the national average on one of these plans, about 6%, now you're, now you're talking. Now you're talking some relief, a couple hundred extra bucks maybe in your pocket every month to navigate your, your, the rest of your adult life. That's and does one. that, so you talked about the credit score impact with, with the credit counseling. Does that severely impact your credit score or it's just uh, maybe minor blip here and there for, for, a year or two. Yeah, so it varies. Um, somebody that is already late with bills a month or two or three and enrolls in one of these plans, you already have some damage from the month or two or three of being late. And that's not going to do much. You're, you're right. going to suffer that drop for probably a year or two after you've been on the plan for a year or two making consecutive payments successfully. Then you can start to see, you know, your, your actual balances, your uh, utilization, so to speak, that that's going down so that your credits, uh, about a third of your score is based on that. So that's becoming healthier, but you had some late pays, which is about a third of your score. And it takes time for them to heal from that a year or two. But if you're current and you're just now enrolling in a debt management plan and you haven't missed any payments and you're not going to miss any payments, it's very credit score neutral. Like I said, you might mm. see one or two point drop. You will not you're probably not going to have any success applying for new credit cards while you're on a managed plan, but you can still get a car loan. You can still get student loans. You can even still get a mortgage when you're on one of these plans showing wow. that, that you're succeeding with the payments. So that's that's the non-confrontational way. The, the, the options that are left after that are 
what I would deem more or less some kind of confrontation. Bankruptcy chapter seven, if you qualify, that's the heavyweight champion of all things debt relief. You can get through, let's say you have $30,000 worth of credit card debt and you qualify for chapter seven. You can be in and out of court in 90 days um, where you live. That might take as many as 120 because your courts are clogged with this stuff, but you're <laughs> I believe uh, it. Yeah. You're, you're looking at a situation where you can get rid of 30 K for under two K and be in and out in 90 days and be able to get a mortgage in two years, FHA, three years. If it's conventional, be able to get student loans in three years, be able to get credit cards a month after your bankruptcy, you'll get pre-approved offers in the mail from capital one and others you're that, that attract that subprime market. Yeah, for sure. A Not month. great limits. Yeah. No, I mean, you're text- okay. I just, I, I, I exited my bankruptcy two weeks ago and I've got an offer. It's only an $800 credit limit and the interest rate is crap, but it's there nonetheless to help you rebuild, right? You can go mm. out and get a car loan at a really decent interest rate 12 months after your, your chapter seven bankruptcy. So when people have to hit the reset and they can qualify, I generally point in that direction unless there's other things that that would do to impede and you can only do it once every eight years so you want to make sure it's worth it you know that kind of thing but it's a man it's a it's a reset button it's a restart it's a refresh that a lot of us can use when things get that tough and then there's a third option and that's when if if you can't afford monthly your income's just not predictable it's not consistent you can't do a debt management plan through the nonprofit agency and you can't qualify or just cannot or should not or will not because people choose not to do a chapter seven you you start looking at settling with your creditors for less than what you owe them as an alternative to chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is kind of the worst of all things, chapter 13. It has its place. Don't get me wrong. It's just very debilitating. And so settling with your creditors, especially for somebody who's already fallen late by more than 90 or more days, I would say that you really take a look at if you can't do the chapter seven. Most banks have protocols, policies, and procedures to negotiate with you to take less than what you owe and just call it good. They'll update your credit to say that you didn't pay it back all the way, settled for less, but zero balance owed, and you can rebuild your life after something like that. Wow. And so if let's say you're going for the, this worst case scenario, is this something where you need to work with somebody to help you negotiate this or are these conversations you can enter in yourself? Yeah, both. It's actually a lot of folks are very confident about talking to creditors and sharing because you do. You have to talk about yourself. You have to talk about what happened. I mean, if you, you have a hardship. There's a reason you have to usually have some kind of dialogue when you're doing this on your own with a creditor or a debt collector or even a collection law firm, you're, you're having to represent your best interest in that negotiation. And you see, you need some reasons. If you're able to do that, if you're confident in those kind of situations, I applaud anybody doing this on their own to the point that I've got over a hundred videos about how to do this yourself on the YouTube channel. I've got, um, over 400 articles on how to do this yourself. I want to empower people that are positioned that way to go out and do this. So you don't have to pay anybody anything. And you just, obviously you're already struggling financially. Financially, there's a whole industry out there that's willing to charge you an arm and a leg to go do that for you. Sure. And, and some people do need that. Don't get me wrong. There are definitely some folks that just don't want to have anything to do with talking to a collector. And I get that. And so I've been helping people do it for 20 years. But I, I want to help them help themselves first. But if they're not down with that, then definitely get some help. We've got here at Resolve, we've got lots of different resources different partners in our network that go out and do this at a, at a much more affordable price than really anybody in the country. So that's helpful. We've got so much more to talk about. But first, a quick message from our episode sponsors. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. 
Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration fixtures so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful, ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Nainen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls, how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. You're right. When somebody's in that situation, <laughs> the last thing they, they can do is pay somebody a ton of money to help them. But I'm also curious, you mentioned about student loan debt. So student loan debt can or can't be discharged in bankruptcy. How does that work? So there's this Bruner test, a little pesky thing called the Bruner test. Basically, you have to be able to show that you're unable, you will be and will remain unable to be to pay back your student loans. So it's an impossibility, basically. And you have to have some kind of hardship. And that hardship is usually something that's going to persist or inability to pay. So, uh, for example, a nurse, you know, years ago, uh, we worked with a woman who was a nurse and she developed, she had a you know, all of her student loans from nursing school. And she developed an allergy to latex. Well, really hard to work as a nurse if you're allergic to latex, right? So here's here's something where you can show, um, and if, you know, other things persisted for this person health-wise that they weren't going to be able to, and they're on disability. Well, now you have an option of going and having what's called an adversarial, potentially, and almost always, you'll have um, an adversarial proceeding in bankruptcy court. And that's how you would, the court would determine whether or not you can discharge your your private or federal student loans. Most are federal, but even private loans with loans are not bankruptable unless you can meet this, this test. And you, what you want to do, if you're concerned and you think that you have the, the kind of situation where your student loans can be discharged in a chapter seven, make sure and talk with an attorney that has this, what is called adversarial proceeding experience, discharging student loans, because a lot of bankruptcy attorneys, it's just kind of forms and paperwork. It's really basic stuff, especially chapter sevens. Most of the time you want to work with somebody that knows their way around these kind of issues on student loans. Right. So most cases of student loan debt, it's just something where you're going to have to figure out how to pay this back. One yeah. way or another. Yep. Yep. So it's what's nice, it, it, call it what it is or whatever it may be for you, depending on your situation. But federal loans, there's no reason to let federal loans go into default ever. 
because they have IBRs, income-based repayment plans, that if you all you can afford based on this measure is $0 a month, then you're considered current and it doesn't even hurt your credit. You're not paying anything. They know you're not paying anything, but it's it's all good. And your credit's not taking a dip and you're not paying these default fees and collection fees and the things that can happen if you just ignore them. But you sometimes, obviously, this is not great because if you're not making any payments, you're not paying down any principal and your actual balances are growing. Or you, you you can actually go into retirement with student loan debt that hasn't been paid. And people are doing that today. And you have to be careful. There's never a time where you want to go into default and have them. This is one of those rare things they can actually garnish your Social Security. The federal government has that ability. And so there's just never a reason to let that happen, even if you co-signed for a loved one where, you know, they're in default, you're not paying because you're a guarantor on it, but you can meet some of these, you know, income-based elements or even the hardship elements, even in bankruptcy, these things apply to co-signers sometimes too. Fascinating. Yeah, that's so good to know. What about these? I see these popping up all the time. These companies like, I'll just throw out a few names, uh, like Lending Club and Payoff and companies like that where people are thinking, okay, well, I could get a personal loan. Maybe it'll be slightly lower interest, pay off my credit cards, and then I'm paying this amount for, let's call it three years, five years, whatever it may be. Are, are things like that attractive? Should we be looking at those types of things? Um, so when you're out there doing, I, I call this the balance transfer boogie, right? You're dancing yeah. to a tune <laughs> where it's like, whatever's going to give me the, the lowest cost to pay back my debt, that's what I'm rolling for. And sometimes it's 0%, but there's fees. So you have to factor that in. But yeah, you can run from one loan and then suddenly the introductory rate is gone or this lower interest rate is this. And so there's this chasing of the affordability factor because you're just trying to go off of monthly cash flow. Your, your plan consists of what can I afford month to month, paycheck to paycheck, basically. And that lasts for some people to the point where they're actually on the other side of it. They get a raise. They're invested in their job. They'd only had to do the balance transfer thing maybe once, twice, or a, some kind of SoFi or net credit or Avant type of loan, these, uh, you know, right. these attractive yeah. Yeah. offers that they might take. And then you, you find yourself in a situation where, okay, that ran out, but my income hasn't increased. In fact, my spending is actually maybe a little up or, and then if they had that transfer and they kept the cards open that they paid off the higher interest stuff and they start using those cards. Now this breaks my heart because I see this. I see a lot of this is, is that you have this higher interest credit card debt. You do some kind of balance transfer the introductory rates over on that card and you do it on another card or you find a, a marketplace lender that we've talked about and you do that. And then you start you bringing up the credit card bills again. And now suddenly you need even a larger loan. Sometimes people are going to tap their home equity to start taking and tackling that. So it's this, um, sometimes you could just see the writing on the wall, right? Because people that are shopping with this mentality, this balance transfer boogie, and you like to dance that tune or you see, you see yourself forced to, it's, it's actually symptomatic. It's, it's more of a symptom then a condition that you find yourself in is because you're, you're, you, you haven't made some necessary changes in your spending or you're what, you know, just what you consider needful. Um, sometimes people do the most amazing thing, Shanna. I mean, you've seen this, I know, where they've gotten out of $150,000 worth of combined credit card and student loan debt inside of three years. They didn't do that by not making some sacrifices, right? And so that's, Rather than run from one account to the next and look for more lower interest rates, unless you need a nonprofit credit counseling agency or something where you're actually not going to be able to go out and get new unsecured debt, which is helpful. Um, I, w- I would say stay away. If you've done it more than once by necessity, that's a pattern. If you do it once and, it, and you succeed with it and you, and, you, and you handle and manage your debt better, great. That, that's, that's a tool. Anything after that, and it's maybe more something other than a tool, maybe more of a crutch. Exactly, exactly. And I know this is probably this is probably a whole other podcast episode, but what you're really speaking at is is the behavior behind debt and behind spending and and really understanding the component of this is how much money I'm making, this is how much I'm spending, what maybe sometimes hard choices do I need to make in order to have those things line up. So what what do you say? Do you have any guidance to people on on how to go about some of those money behavior, money mindset cha- changes, so that they don't see themselves in situations like this? Yeah, get to know yourself. Really, really 
this is, you know, basic stuff. This isn't about making a list and seeing where you can pare down costs on cell phone plans and internet, you know, and, and disconnect and just get things in packages and, you know, stop eating out so much. Okay, great. I don't need, I don't need that that mocha on the way to work every morning or, or whatever it is. A lot of us want to go out and go out with friends and have drinks. Drinks are flipping expensive, right? Yeah. This, that's all, that's all well and good. But I tell people just get even more, just strip down from there and get to know yourself and how you're, how do you relate to money? What is your relationship with money now? And what do you want your relationship with money to be 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? And just if you want to write it down on paper, that's a really good exercise. But who are you about money? Are you a saver? Are you a spender? Are there people in your circle of influence that you recognize as savers? What are some of the habits that they have? Reading a book is great. Reading online, listening to these podcasts, this is all great, great information. And start, you know, instead of at the gym, I have a tendency and I'm a finance guy. I'm a, I want to listen to music. I want to rock out. I want to get, get my blood Totally. Going. But, you know, there's there's a lot of folks that I know that go to the gym and they they listen to audio books. They listen to podcasts. I'm like, really? You can do that and stay energized? And, oh, yeah. The, all of this stuff. But I think more than anything is talking talking to people in your circle of influence. And it's it's hard. We don't talk about money. I can tell you this, my experience working with people in a in a debt situation. I'm all I'm all triage all the time, right? People come to me when they have trouble, not when things are going awesome. Mm-hmm. And I think it's harder from from my experience, it's harder for people to talk about debt or lack of money and being broke with their friends and peers than it would be to talk about themselves or a loved one being addicted to drugs or you know, Completely. drinking or something. It's just, it's, we don't talk about it. And so if you, if you start having that conversation, start talking to some people that you care about and that, you know, care about you and that they have that mentality and they look like they have things going on. And now you have an ongoing support group and conversation that it's not taboo that you guys talk about money. It's not just listening to things and pre- putting things into practice It's actually having somebody that you're accountable to around, or at least you don't, you know, not accountable to like a parent or anything, but I'm just talking about somebody that it's like, okay, we, we, we do talk about this kind of thing. Let's go out and have that cup of coffee once a month. And let's, let's have that conversation. Try that. Get to know yourself, get to know yourself and how you relate to money. Even somebody just to be a cheerleader, just to cheer you on and and check in on you. Like you said, I mean, that's so important because you're right. It is so taboo. I mean, I talk to people all the time being a certified financial planner. I'm no longer practicing, but people still know me as that. So I'll ask them a question about money or about debt or about a goal, and they'll get very shy and sheepish to say, oh, I can't tell you. I'm like, okay, I've heard everything. There's nothing you're going to say to me that is going to be shocking or original or new. And suddenly they're like, oh, all right. And once you get those words out of your mouth, it's a lot easier to move forward from that place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm also curious to know... What is happening with medical debt? Because I really see that another area of rising debt, especially with younger people who are shocked, perhaps, when they go to have a procedure and maybe their insurance isn't the best insurance or maybe they don't have insurance anymore. And looking at the cost of medical debt, is is that something you're seeing on your end as well? So it's expensive, right? It's one of the largest expenses that we have. And we're often unprepared. Uh, we have our deductibles. There's still people that don't have coverage. Um, depending on what kind of cost and how surprising it is and how unprepared we might be for it, it's, it's the leading cause of bankruptcy after. Uh, so it's really? first, yeah, first it's, it's medical debt and then it's family separation, divorce and, you know, that kind of thing. Suddenly you have a, a two income household and it's stripped down to half of that one, one income and it's hard to make it right. But medical debt is like overnight debilitating. It's just like having somebody that you share all the expensive with uh, expenses with, um, and they're gone. And then now it's like overnight, this is like this financial, like, whoa, new reality and medical stuff. It's needful. And so there's things you just can't put off. And here you are straddled with this, you know, X amount of dollars, 10, 15, sometimes $40,000 even. What's, what's helpful sometimes is these service providers and billing companies can often put together a plan for you, but they're also, there's many, many situations where they're just flat out unwilling to work with you on a payment plan that's consistent with your ability. And so you find yourself in medical collection. And when that happens, um, you know, in the credit damage after six months, it can appear. It used to be you could have medical debt and, and not have paid it. 
you know, a month or two and it's on your credit. Now it has to take six months before they can put it on there. But if you've gone uh, with medical debt unpaid for six months and it's on there and you see that credit hit and you start to lose some of the options that you can do using other forms of credit to even pay down the debt. And that's, that's when it's really time to have a, a conversation with an attorney local to you talk about bankruptcy, depending on how much that debt is. I typically tell people, look, if it's less than 10 K, I'm not sure what benefit there is to bankruptcy because even medical debt, you can settle for less. You can negotiate. Let's say it's, it's 10, 10 grand. You, um, you, you settle it for five grand. Well, the cost of bankruptcy nationally average is, is 1800 bucks. We'll call it 2000. So you're filing over 3000, not really worth it. But once you get up into those higher numbers of medical debt, you really should start, start looking at a chapter seven. That's such great information. Well, I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more. You mentioned that you have with Resolve some videos and, and information online, but tell me a little bit more about Resolve and, and how you can help people who are in these debt situations. Sure. So we're a unique company. We're a technology company, and it's kind of a marriage of technology and human, caring humans, you know, and, and technology combined to help people make good decisions. That's really what Resolve is. We are an information provider. So you go to our different sites and get information. You, We've built a technology, a tool that can help you assess your debt relief options. It's hands off. You don't have to talk to anybody. We've programmed it with all information, even at your state level, whether you're going to qualify for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. You go in there and, and, and it starts to look at, okay, here's your situation. Here's your creditors. And we have information about different creditors programmed in there. And you start to look at your cash flow and what you can do. And it'll take you down a decision tree. And, and again, very private, hands-off. You can do it from your phone. You can do it from your computer, anywhere. And get a beat on, okay, well, that's not going to work for me because it's just going to disqualify you because you make too much money. Can't qualify for Chapter 7. Have too much equity in your home. Can't qualify. Or I, can't, I don't have enough of a dependable income or my credit's important to me because I have these goals two years from now, then it doesn't want you to do certain things. But it'll tell you, okay, here's what we would suggest you would at least look to get more information about. And with that, you then can go talk to people that are part of our network that are awesome groups of and organizations, nonprofit credit counseling agencies, attorneys, um, debt people that provide debt negotiation and have an unbiased conversation with a counselor who's not tied to any outcome. Their only goal is to help you get informed and make some compare and contrast efforts towards what's going to fit for you to get out of, out of debt with your goals near and, and midterm two, three, five years. And from there, you'll be able to make hopefully the best informed decision about the path that you're going to take. So that's very unique. It's not done. Most debt relief organizations out there are just there to try and get you and sell you on their one widget that they make profit from. And we're not here to sell you any widgets. We're just, we're an information company. It's, it's, um, it's really new. It's not really done. And I'm super excited to be a part of it. Yeah, that makes me feel really good inside. <laughs> There's a company out there that's not trying to gouge you or sell a widget, but really is there just to help people understanding that when you're in these types of situations, it is painful and stressful and you can fill in the word, whatever that might be for you. But that's a really tough spot. Well, I would love for you, Michael, to to leave the listeners going into getting ready to roll into 2020. What steps, if you could whittle them down to one, two, three do you think someone should take right now if they're looking at a debt situation to help them get rid of this debt for good? So find a way to one of two things, pare down your expenses or increase your income. Those are the two. I mean, it's, it's, it's resources, right? So you either need to pare back your spending to create the resources to apply to the debt in that whole, you know, avalanche, that snowball kind of um, plan that you would, you would progress with starting today. Or you if you can't pare down costs anymore, and believe me, I know that there are situations where there's just, what else can I shave off? Then you have to look at what are some means for you to increase your income. If your goal is to get out of debt, those are the one or the other, or a combination of the two is what you have to look at doing. Such great tips. Michael, I'd love for you to tell the listeners where they can go to connect with Resolve and learn more. You bet. Yeah. Just go to helloresolve.com. So hello, resolve. 
Com. You can build a user profile. You don't even have to give us any personal information to put information in there to get information out. If you do want to talk with a counselor, you don't have to, but you're more than welcome to go through that experience building your user profile, take any of those prompts to talk with somebody, including me. I'm in the rotation, so you might have a you might be scheduling a 30-minute conversation with me to talk over what your options are, what your issues are, what your concerns are, and how to move forward putting together a plan that works for you. All right, Sheila, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation again. There are so many gems in there that I think are really worth listening to this episode over and over and over again. Again, I love your question, Sheila, because it was about the mindset around debt, right? And and the idea that it is unrealistic to think that you're never going to be in debt again. But if you have the strategies and tools and you have the good frame of mind around debt, It doesn't have to always be the scary two-headed monster. So I hope this conversation, again, inspired you. I know that there is definitely somebody else listening that really needed to hear this message today as well. If you enjoyed this episode, do me a favor, share it with friends and family members, anybody who you else really know needs to hear this message on debt. As always, I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Hey you, yes, you, before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.